Welcome to the All Things Nintendo podcast. I'm Brian Shea from Game Informer, and this is a weekly podcast to discuss all the biggest news and games from the world of Nintendo. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode featuring Atari CEO Wade Rosen. That was definitely one of my favorite episodes to record. This week, we're going to play catch up on all the news that we missed last week, and then I'm going to give some very brief impressions on the new Pokemon Scarlet and Violet expansion now that I've had a chance to finally dive in. Joining me for this is Wesley LeBlanc. Wes, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm not a CEO, but um, I think I'm still pretty cool. You're, you're all right. You know, like <laughs> you're a, a member of the Game Informer family, and I think that's even more special. I think so, too. <laughs> so we're kind of in the calm before the storm of the October game releases. Uh, Just we've been talking about that a lot in the Game Informer staff of like, all right, the, the review season is finally about to really, really kick off. I mean, obviously, we've all been super busy with the games that have been coming out. There have been some heavy hitters, but we are it, like October is just the avalanche and like the floodgates opening. Uh, but we have some news to catch up on. We don't have a ton of other stuff to talk about, but we're going to try something a little bit different at the tail end of this episode. Not quite a definitive ranking, but something a little bit in that vein. So stay tuned for that on the tail end of this episode. But Wes, we've got some news to talk about. Last week, you did a lot of coverage on this, but we got a ton of Xbox-related news thanks to mm. the FTC court proceedings that are happening right now involving the attempted acquisition of Activision Blizzard. By the way, acquisition of Activision <laughs> is a tongue twister. It's fun um, to write, though. <laughs> but uh, we got next console plans. We got a, a leak of a potential mid-generation refresh a tentative release schedule of major games for the next like eight years <laughs> from Bethesda specifically, <laughs> from Bethesda yeah. specifically. Uh, but one interesting element was that in August, 2020, there was an email chain that seemed to indicate that Phil Spencer, head of Xbox briefly considered acquiring Nintendo. So uh, talk me through this. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you say briefly, cause I, I think, Every uh, company, every video game player out there uh, and head of a company is probably at some point thinking about acquiring Nintendo because sure, why wouldn't you want to acquire one of the most renowned video game makers in the world? Um, but yeah, uh, it's interesting to see that on email and for it to be so candid um, because we don't usually see uh, Xbox heads emails that he sends privately to other employees at Xbox. But basically, he's like, yeah, I want to acquire Nintendo. It's It would be my career-defining moment. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Nintendo's future is off of its hardware and elsewhere, which is the funniest thing to me. Um, but he understands it's probably not possible at this time because, as everyone knows, Nintendo has uh, one of the biggest war chests to sit on in gaming probably second only to Microsoft, to be honest. Um, but curiously, there's a lot of business talk in there. And it seems that Xbox and Microsoft do think that it's a real possibility that they could acquire Nintendo one day. They've got a ex Xbox buddy who is, you know, doing stock stuff. And maybe one day there's enough where they can own Nintendo. But they, Phil Spencer says it is not, they would, they do not want to go the hostile takeover route, which would be buying an exorbitant amount of stocks to the point where you are the majority stakeholder. It would not be an agreement between the two. It would just be Xbox spending money. Uh, but he makes it very clear they don't want to do that. So I don't think that Nintendo being an Xbox-owned entity is ever going to happen. Oh, no. In that regard. Still, so, so fascinating to see an email like this come out. Yeah, and everybody was always speculating like, oh, they're going to probably buy Sega. That was the one that yeah. everybody was kind of speculating at least a couple years ago. But this was kind of right in the midst of Xbox going on their like studio acquisition spree. And in that same email chain, you know, he mentions also maybe Warner Brothers, maybe ZeniMax, which, you know, ended up actually happening. <laughs> so it's interesting that like these were the this was like the trio of names that were kicked around Warner Brothers, Nintendo and ZeniMax. And then ZeniMax ended up being the one that actually came to fruition of those three. Yeah, I'm curious how you feel, you know, as our Nintendo expert, um, Phil says the future of Nintendo is off its hardware, probably alluding to they should put their games on Game Pass or we should own them. And then they can just have Xbox as their console. Like, how do you feel about that? Because for me, 
it's a bold statement considering the Switch is the best selling console on the market right now. Yeah, it's it's so tricky because like this next story that we're actually going to be talking about is highlighting why some industry people probably feel that Switch or a Nintendo would be better off putting their games on more powerful consoles because, you know, it everybody points out in 2017 when the Switch came out, which, you know, over 6 years ago, the the console was outdated then. You know, yeah. like it was not as it was not up to the industry standard of its competitors then. However, it's still it's shown that maybe power isn't everything because, like you said, it's the best selling console uh, by a large margin of yeah. this generation. And, uh, you know, it's the second best selling system Nintendo's ever put out. The, the best selling console Nintendo's ever put out. The only thing that beats it in Nintendo stable is the DS. And the only thing mm-hmm. that beats the DS is the PS2, which is only by a very slim margin. So the Switch has done very well for itself. I think that. The idea that like Nintendo's future is on other people's hardware makes sense from that perspective of like, you know, they've never really put out the most technically proficient uh, hardware that that delivers the most oomph. Like that's what the Xbox Series X and the PS5 were all about. It's like efficiency. Like we've got these the this hardware architecture that streamlines the processing directly into the SSD and I know none of what I just said makes sense but like <laughs> you know they're talking about how fast can we load this game how how quickly can we make these textures look photorealistic and how cool can we make it so that when you pull a trigger on the dual sense controller it makes it so it feels like you're actually pulling a bow out of Aloy's uh out of Aloy's art or inventory and like actually pulling the string back to release an arrow. And it's like, that is really cool stuff. Nintendo's like, yeah, well, you know, you can play our game in your dock and make it be like a console, or you can pick it up and keep playing and it's on the go. And that's, that's it. And like, you know, they and also HD our game is Mario <laughs> and our game is, they also, you know, the, the advantage that Nintendo will always have. And I've, I've said this multiple times, Nintendo as a publisher also happens to have exclusive rights to the greatest game developer in video game history, which also happens to be Nintendo. Yeah. So it's like it's, Nintendo, the platform holder and Nintendo, the publisher instantly benefit from having Nintendo, the developer. Yeah. And then not even like just mo- like their partners too, like game freak having Pokemon. Mm-hmm. If you took away Mario, what's the biggest video game property in the world? Probably Pokemon other than like maybe grand theft auto, but yeah. like, they also have Pokemon, and Pokemon is exclusive to their devices, not counting Pokemon Go. Um, Nintendo is, f- I think, forever going to be just fine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to imagine Mario in any capacity showing up on an Xbox console. I mean, I, I posited a while ago, like, I mean, this was probably like 2018, maybe. I wrote this opinion piece whenever all of these, like, Xbox and Nintendo partnerships were arising. I was like... You know, I bet Xbox would just pull out the big bucks just to get like even a streaming, like a cloud version of a Mario game on Game yeah. Pass. And it's like it, I was not like meaning like, oh, you know, like a Nintendo game will be released exclusively for an Xbox console. But could you imagine if if Xbox was just like, hey, we'll give you like a billion dollars to put <laughs> new Super Mario Brothers U, a game from over a decade ago <laughs> on Game Pass like. I could I could potentially see that happening, but also at the same time, Nintendo is very stubborn in that way. Yeah. So I, one, I don't think there's any situation unless there is just some cataclysmic event at Nintendo that causes them to just burn through that massive stockpile of cash they're sitting on. They made Something- it through the Wii U and the GameCube. <laughs> and like, there, I, I don't know what a cataclysmic event for Nintendo is, to be honest, at this point. Yeah, it would have to be like, a run of like three virtual boy level failures in a row. Yeah. And even then I think that they would be fine. It would have to be like something like that for Nintendo to even humor a friendly takeover, a friendly acquisition in my opinion. I mean, I, I the yeah, only I route agree. I think to acquiring Nintendo is the hostile route, which Phil Spencer specifically said he does not want to go down, which I think is good. I mean, we saw the toll that it took on Ubisoft. I think what was that? 2016, yeah. 2017 something like that when it was it what was it viacom that was trying to hostile take over them and they were able to resist it they were able to push back and they they stayed independent and uh you know that's definitely for the best because we see how a lot of these acquisitions go they bring in 
these companies, they acquire the IPs and then look at what Embracer's doing right now, where they're just shutting down, laying off people left and right. Yeah. This has been an absolutely awful year for that. And Embracer is just kind of the start. We just got news that Creative Assembly is getting lays off, layoffs. Uh, Epic Games is getting layoffs. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of acquisitions end up going. They, they want to acquire the the, License, the, the licenses, the IPs, the name. Like, look at what uh, Xbox did with Rare. Nothing. Like, I mean, we've yep. still, Sea of Thieves is very well liked at this point, but like, when they acquired Rare, they it's like, oh, Rare's like, oh man, they're gonna get like Banjo Kazooie, and they're gonna, and they did get Banjo Kazooie, but like, we didn't get a Banjo Kazooie level game like we got on the N sixty four. Everybody's like, yeah. oh, this is the developer that made Goldeneye. That's gonna be incredible, and you know, we got Perfect Dark Zero, which not a good game. So it's like, <laughs> I really, I, I have a lot of uh, hesitation when it comes to acquisitions. But that said, Xbox has done a good job of seemingly allowing in recent memory anyway i mean rare is a is a different era for xbox when they acquired them when you look at the the recent acquisitions the 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 2019s and laters those are the ones that i look at and they're like okay they seem to have learned some lessons in terms of like retaining talent and giving them their independence and autonomy while still bringing them under the umbrella and maybe giving them the funding that they wouldn't have had otherwise i think that is the mark of a good acquisition yeah nintendo doesn't need the the bankroll necessarily because they they're doing pretty well for themselves do they nintendo doesn't i don't see their name often in layoff news do they is that just like a rare thing over there yeah i don't think that they've really done any layoffs and if they have it hasn't really been like a public thing and like i saw a report come out that it was like Nintendo has like a 98.75% employee retention rate. So it's like people join Nintendo. I mean, I was just talking to Takashi Tezuka who joined Nintendo in 1984. 1984. (laughs) That's That's 39 years ago. And, you know, he's not like just some rare outlier. You know, Shigeru Miyamoto has been there longer than him. Koji Kondo has been there longer than him. Uh, Eiji Aonuma has joined in the the mid nineties. And then, uh, Shiro Mori, who is the director of Super Mario Brothers Wonder. He's been there since like 1998, 1999. So it's like all of these luminaries have been at Nintendo for so long. And it's like not only do layoffs not really seem to happen with Nintendo, but like people just don't really leave Nintendo all that often. And yeah. like we've seen that with why I think that's that's a large reason why we have such like a uh, to, to borrow a phrase from Nintendo, a seal of quality with a lot of Nintendo mm-hmm. franchises. Like, why can you always expect that a Mario game is going to be good? Oh, it's because we have these veteran developers who have been with the series forever while also bringing in new developers. And yeah. the same thing goes for Zelda. And the same thing goes for almost all of their franchises. And then you have companies like Bioware who went through layoffs. And we, we find out that the layoffs are taking out a large chunk of like that veteran staff. And everyone's like, why... Would you do that? That's experience that you can't buy. Like you need that. And and you know, to your point, yeah, Nintendo keeps those people around and we get good games as a result. That's the the short sightedness of a lot of corporate executives, I think, is they look yeah. at the salaries. people as salaries and numbers and like even just employee identification numbers. They don't look at like what you lose. Like they're like, okay, we made the bottom line. We we cut X number of dollars from our our bank roll, our salary roll. We're good. We, we've appeased yeah. our, our shareholders or whoever they need to appease. And then it's like, oh, but you also cut like so many decades of experience and the people who made this company, the people who built this company. Like, what did I see that like Disney and Pixar laid off the person that saved Toy Story 2? Yeah, like that, like that literally saved the actual movie from existence. The like. cataclysmic, speaking of cataclysmic events, the yeah. event that let, like the, the Pixar back when Toy Story 2 was being made, like had like a giant like server crash or something or, or hard drive crash that erased all memory basically of Toy Story 2. The only reason Toy Story 2 exists is because this person happened to like be working from home for like a week or something like that. And they had a copy on their local (laughs) PC at home and they're like, Oh, I have one. We can just, you know, they only lost like a week or two of work instead of having to start over from scratch. So it's like, and then that person got laid off. What was it later or earlier this year or late last year or something like that. And it's just like, man, like I, I don't, I don't know what that person has done outside of that in terms of like their career, but like, 
you know, that's enough look, though. <laughs> that, that's a big one. That's probably yeah. Pixar's most beloved movie, right? Yeah, one of them for sure. It's my favorite of uh, the there. Toy Stories, but I know, um, yeah, regardless, it's like top five probably. But yeah, it's yeah. just, um, yeah, I mean, when they cut staff, it's it's strictly a numbers game, and that's kind of what we see across the board. And yeah, from the outside looking in, you see these stories like Epic today, 900 people. I can't even fathom that. Like 900 people that had jobs yesterday don't. And they work on the biggest, most popular game that you can play right now that makes bukus of money between battle passes and skins and collaborations. And even that company is not safe from Not only that, playoffs. they also make the largest, most widely used game engine. Yeah, so that they're too. Making, yeah. They're making so much money. And also, by the way, they raised the price of V-Bucks in case you missed that news earlier today. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, things are more expensive. And also we're cutting 16% of our staff. And it's like this industry has a serious problem. I, I, I Honestly, it is like the most anxiety inducing thing to see uh, even like super profitable companies like Epic Games cutting people like that. And it's, I, I really hope that Everybody who was affected by that uh, is able to find something new, but it, it's it's disheartening to look on the uh, like LinkedIn, like firing up LinkedIn and seeing people still being like, you know, I was laid off nine months ago and I'm still looking for a job in the games yeah. industry. It's like we have players, fans, critics like us talking about how this is a historically good year for the games industry. So many amazing games. We're going to be talking about that on the tail end of the show of like, wow, look how good even the remainder of this year. This has already been a historic year for game releases to this point. But like even the the tail end of this year is going to be unbelievable in terms of releases. And then on the other side, it's contrasted against how many layoffs and studio closures have happened in the calendar year of 2023. And it's just, yeah. it's whiplash inducing. And yeah, it, it's, it's awful. It's disheartening. Like if this year isn't the year that can keep people in jobs, I don't know what year does. And then we lose these jobs and they don't get filled. They just become, you know, X's on an employee map. And like now the company is smaller and there's still people that need jobs. And yeah, it's, it's tough out there. And I know like games aren't the only industry affected by this kind of like corporate behavior. It's pretty much any industry where there are businesses and shareholders to please that happens. And it's just, it's really disheartening across the board. Like, I did finding a job in 2023 regardless is just disheartening. Yeah. And don't worry, these corporations will just keep making the team sizes smaller and keep piling <laughs> on more responsibilities without giving their current employees more pay. So it, it's, course, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not a, it's not a house of cards at all. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Moving <laughs> on from that. Uh, you know, we talked about this very briefly in terms of like, you know, where Nintendo's future might lie outside of its own hardware and in, in the opinion of some people, uh, you know, we, we did see that reports of like a new Nintendo console keep popping up. Uh, we, most recently, I think at Gamescom, it, it, it sounded like Nintendo gave a behind closed door demo to a few different publishers, one of which being Activision saying like, hey, like, here's our new system. And apparently it was uh, on par or around the uh, the power levels of like an Xbox One or PS4 which mm-hmm. is better than what the Switch was. Um, but, you know, what the, take that all with a grain of salt. But here's the thing I really wanted to get to. Um, the new Nintendo console might be coming just in time because it feels like there have been more and more games coming out on Switch. There are you know, third-party releases, even some first-party slash second-party releases, like in terms of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, that just don't run well on this <laughs> system. Yeah. And the latest big one is Mortal Kombat 1. So have you looked into this at all about how yeah, yeah. <laughs> how poorly this game runs on the Switch? It's like got to be one of the worst in recent memory. Uh, like when your game is a, is a running meme, when there's like uh, multiple running memes of your game, um, it's not a good sign. And it's so shocking to see a game released in this state that they expect people to pay 60 or $70 for. Yeah, seventy dollars is the price tag on Mortal Kombat One on Switch and uh, all other platforms. But the other platforms run so well, so it's yeah. like not. I, I don't have a problem when you look at like how the industry has been trending. Which, by the way, another reason that <laughs> it's like, all right, we're we're paying more money and yet less people get to keep their jobs. But we yeah. already moved on from this topic. Let's <laughs> move. We're moving on to uh, to hopefully more lighthearted stuff soon. But I was watching a video 
Um, I believe it was Nintendo Life's video just showing gameplay and how the, the gameplay of Mortal Kombat 1 runs. When you select your character, you know, they lean in and like kind of like trade like one-liners at each other, like in each other's face. In on PS5, it is almost instantaneous. As soon as like they deliver their lines, they're back and they're ready to fight. And it's like, okay, that's good. On the Switch, I watched it and they even put a timer at the bottom. 40 seconds to get to the fight. So they deliver their line from the time you hit, yes, these are the characters I want to do. They deliver their lines and then like it takes 40 seconds to get to the actual fight. <laughs> it's like, that's, man. Yeah, that's rough. And even like in story mode, normally like in story mode, you would get like the cutscene and then it would just like tr- seamlessly transition. That's how it worked on PS5, seamlessly transition into the fight. This time it actually goes to like a black screen with the Mortal Kombat logo while it loads into the fight. And it just complete immersion breaking, uh, really bad textures, as you mentioned, very memeable faces. Uh, Melina <laughs> and Johnny yeah. Cage, they just look awful. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, Invasions was a buggy mess. And there was a, uh, a, you know, Invasions is like nine hours of content every six weeks. It's on a seasonal basis. That's how you get a lot of the cosmetics. On the Switch, they only had that first world, the tutorial of Johnny Cage's mansion in it. And even then, it was a buggy mess. Like, I was reading reports of, like, how people would go on and, like, they would complete the first mission. You're supposed to be rewarded with the key to the house so you can go into the house and, like, do the rest of the tutorial uh, invasions area. And the, it just wasn't dropping the key. So nobody could get past that first node. And... Yeah, like this is an the, entire feature set of the game just blocked off on Switch. Yeah. And it's again full price. It's not like you get a discount for buying it on Switch. So this game was ported by the same people who did the Mortal Kombat 11 port, but remember that was actually there was a last gen version of that game. There's no last gen version of Mortal Kombat 1. So I wonder if that was like the big gap that existed there, but it was ported by Shiver Entertainment and Saber Interactive. Uh, but, you know, Ed Boon, who is the co-creator of the franchise and the the head at NetherRealm, who did the, the main version of the game, he did an interview with BBC and said that the game will be getting updates. And he said, quote, it would have been ideal for us to have released the version that we absolutely wanted, but anything that we're finding a problem with is on our list and is going to be fixed. Oh, good. So... I mean, it's good that they're committing to fixing it. Apparently, Mortal Kombat 11 also had some some issues at launch. I did not really pay too much attention to that back then. But people in I was you know reading up Reddit. I was reading comments on articles and everything. And everybody's like, yeah, the, the launch version of Mortal Kombat 11 was also bad. And then they eventually got it to where it needs to be. But this seems like it's a bigger gap than any game I can remember from like a multi-platform release. Yeah, it's it's interesting, too, because um, looking at this, I was thinking of uh, another big release that happened right now is Cyberpunk 2077's Phantom Ooh, Liberty yeah. expansion. And that got me thinking about 2077 on PS4 and Xbox One and how it was so bad that Sony pulled it off its stores um, because they needed CDPR to fix it and make it more playable. And it's interesting because I think, I mean, I haven't like directly compared and contrasted the two, and I don't know how broken they are over each other but Mortal Kombat 1 seems like completely broken like you should not purchase it on Switch and I I'm just, I was just thinking like man I wonder if Nintendo has ever considered like pulling a game to save its console's reputation in such a way that PlayStation did because I don't I mean they haven't but like this is this seems pretty rough and if entire sets of the game are unplayable you shouldn't be charging $70 for it yeah I don't know what the best course of action is but it it seems like something has to be done whether it's i mean i almost think that warner brothers itself should like delist it or like even slash the price or something but who knows because uh nothing's ever getting cheaper ever again um (laughs) (laughs) so that release does not instill much confidence in this next news piece which i'm reading again over at nintendo life red dead redemption 2 has appeared for Switch on a Brazil rating board website. This is not confirmed in any way. There's really no indication of when this listing was added. So it might be an old thing that somebody just dug up in in wake of Red Dead Redemption 1 coming to Switch recently. So this might have been there for, you know, when Red Dead Redemption 2 originally came out in 2018. Maybe a Brazil ratings board put that up there and just by accident. But 
I don't know what kind of concessions will need to be made on Red Dead Redemption 2. That's as beautiful and uh, high res and uh, technically proficient as Mortal Kombat 1 is. And yes, it's only on PS5 and Xbox Series X outside of the Switch version, which we're not going to talk about. Uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, I feel like, is more technically impressive and Mm -hmm. a bigger feat to transition over there, especially considering how massive that world is and how detailed that open world is. What do you think? What, what do you think could even possibly make RDR two run on Switch? I, I think, and I hope that this is just like a cloud version because I really I don't know how the heck you get Red Dead Redemption two. Still to this day, that game came out in twenty eighteen or nineteen. Still one of the most beautiful games I think you can play today, mm-hmm. um, and it's massive. Like it's an, a, a giant world that remembers your place in it. It's not like you know, whatever you do over here will be remembered when you go way over here. And I don't, I just don't think, I, I don't know. I don't see how the Switch can do it. I mean, Rockstar is good at what they do and maybe they're working on a port specific to Switch's hardware that allows it to happen. But if, I would be cautious buying this if it was like a native game, basically. Oh yeah, I mean, I would be, again, I'd be cautious because like the only reason I would want to buy this for Switch would be to have it on the go. Yeah, And to have this game on the go is going to require massive concessions. And if it's a cloud version, which I think I agree with you, it, it takes a lot for me to be like, yes, they should put a cloud version of this game on the Switch. Yeah. But if they're, if they're going to put this on the Switch, it should absolutely be a cloud version because that's the only way this is going to run on on Switch, right? Like, yeah. uh, at least in a reasonable way. But like then at that point, it's like, oh, well, if I'm at a place where I can put my switch on like a reliable internet source i'm just gonna play it on my xbox series x exactly yep so yeah i don't know there's again that's not confirmed to be happening it might be an old listing that somebody dug up but it it did surface semi-recently it's it's a weird one too because like now and like now you want to put it on switch rockstar it's been pretty much the switch's entire life and we are probably we probably have less than a year with our switch maybe a little bit over it depending on when a switch 2 comes out um yeah, I don't know. Like at that point, just port it to that console. Like, there's no reason to release it on Switch. Yeah, it's. I, I don't know how that's gonna play out. But here's a game that I think the Switch can run okay. We have a new game added to the Switch Online Game Boy Advance library. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. I hope we can play it. Yeah, Kirby and the Amazing Mirror. Finally, a game that runs well on Switch. Uh, it's a 2004 Game Boy Advance game has both local and online multiplayer because of the Switch Online capabilities of being able to like basically act like a an online game, but like locally, or sorry, I got that reverse, a local game, but through online, just everybody joins the same session as if they're sitting next to you. Uh, but it's out today for those who subscribe to the Switch Online Plus Expansion Pack. I missed this game back when it first came out. I was not the biggest Game Boy Advance player, but did you have a chance to check this out? I did not know, which is weird because I played like a ton of stuff on Game Boy Advance. Mm. I was still one of my favorite little consoles of all time. Um, yeah, my history with Kirby really starts and ends at, uh, I don't even know what it was called, but it was Forgotten on the- Land? Um, no, on the original Game Boy with the green oh, screen. like the Dreamland? Big, yeah, Kirby's Dreamland, yeah, where he was still, uh, Kirby was not pink yet because that did not have color. Um, and I love that game. I- um, it's still one of my favorites of that uh, generation, the Game Boy. Um, but yeah, I never really dug too much else into Kirby for some reason. But, you should check out um, Forgotten Land. That is, I know, I need to, yeah, yeah. Originally, everybody was like, oh my god, it's Kirby but Mario Odyssey. But then everybody finally played it. They're like, oh no, it's Kirby but Mario 3D World. So I know your love for Mario Ooh, 3D World. So yeah. It's okay, that that's sh- the best sell I've heard so far in this game. That's <laughs> I like that. So yeah, go check that out. Kirby and the Forgotten Land, one of the better games, most one of the more underappreciated games on Switch. Yeah, I can. And agree by the with way, that. that's another developer that Nintendo has worked extensively with. Hal. Yeah. And put out substantially better games than a lot of uh, third-party partnerships have produced for other consoles. So, shout out to Hal. Um, <laughs> shout out Hal. Speaking of third-party developers, uh, we have some news out of Platinum Games. Mm. Hideki Kamiya, one of the figureheads of Platinum Games, has announced he is leaving. So while at Platinum, he directed Bayonetta 1, 
and the wonderful 101. So two games that you can play on Switch. And uh, was the supervisor of Bayonetta 2, Astral Chain, Bayonetta 3, and Bayonetta Origins, Syriza and the Lost Demon. And then before Platinum, he was at Capcom, where he directed Resident Evil 2, Devil May Cry, Beautiful Joe, and Okami. So a uh, pretty solid resume right yeah. there, if I do one say so greatest. myself. Yeah, yeah. That, that, outside of Nintendo, that's one of the better resumes you're going to find in a developer. Yeah, I wrote the story for us and I was just like looking at like his history because I knew him as Platinum, but I didn't know what he did before. And to find out that he directed Resident Evil 2, which is like secretly one of the best Resident Evil games, especially now that the remake exists, like mm-hmm. that blew my mind. Like, yeah, this guy is awesome. And we don't know how or why he left Platinum, but if it's on Platinum, then like shame on them because this dude's awesome. It seems like it was under his own volition. Like he was talking yeah. about how he's still he's looking forward to making games his own way still like in his next chapter. So I would not be surprised if he has um, something lined up. He is set to leave Platinum on October 12th. So that's his, that's going to be his last day. But, uh, you know, Shinji Mikami, who uh, the creator of Resident Evil, also recently kind of left his gig over yeah. at uh, Tango. So maybe those two would reunite. I don't know. I, I, did you posit that in yours or is that somewhere else that I, I saw? No, that no, I, I I saw that um, elsewhere. I think even maybe uh, Game Informer editor Blake uh, Hester had tweeted about it or something because he loves uh, Mikami. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that is that would be very cool. They, they could make, well, not House of Dead because that actually exists. I don't know. Resident <laughs> Evil, but a different name um, would be awesome. Yeah, uh, or, uh, you know, there's been some other acquisitions going on, especially with, like, a company like NetEase. They've been making major yeah. moves. Um, I would not be surprised if they're like, hey, come found your own studio over under us. You know, they're they're working with, uh, you know, Grasshopper Manufacturer, aka Suda51's developer, development studio, uh, Tasuhiro Nagoshi, the, the guy who's behind the Yakuza series. He is yeah. also working under NetEase now. So, um yeah, they're, they're making some big moves, so I would not be surprised if they, this was maybe another one of those. But we'll, we'll have to wait and see. October 12th, maybe we'll get some news after that date uh, or you know, shortly or shortly after then. But uh, yeah, shout out to Hideki Kamiya for an amazing run at Platinum Games. Uh, just a few more here. Vampire Survivors. You mm-hmm. know it. You love it. They have a new free update coming out. This adds a new stage called Whiteout. It looks like it's a snow stage, a new character, a new weapon, uh, which looks like it's called Glass Fandango, which is like this kind of like shooting out like these crystals while while you move. And apparently it's stronger when you're actually moving. A lot of these, uh, Mm. once you get them upgraded, a lot of the weapons, like you just kind of want to plant yourself and let the enemies come to you. So like like the, the, the Bible, for example, like it spins around you. And if you get that upgrade enough, it'll just be like a a force field around you essentially. So this one actually incentivizes you to keep moving, which I like. Um, but yeah, this is a free update coming soon to all platforms. I think you, you've specifically said you have not checked out vampire survivors yeah, for fear still, of getting hooked. I'm still in that boat and I'm going to stay strong because October is not the month to check out vampire survivors, but I'm going to do it one day. I own it. Like I have, I have, and it's on Game Pass. I have ways to play this game. Switch um, is the way to go. I'm telling you. It runs yeah. great on Switch. We're, we're giving games a lot of crap for running poorly on Switch. Vampire Survivors, I have had a great time. It's become my my main way to play that game is on Switch. Oh, okay. And it's also yeah. an amazing game on a flight. If you have any what? flights coming up, Wes, download Vampire Survivors. It, like if you buy it and like buy all the DLC, it's like a total of like nine bucks. Yeah, I saw that. Um, <laughs> it's one day I will be on here and I'll be like, hey, have you heard of this game called Vampire Survivors? It's really good. I'll immediately um, end the podcast without letting <laughs> you give your impressions. Uh, Wes, we have a few new announcements of physical editions of some games that we've actually covered on here in the past. So TMNT Shredder's Revenge Anniversary Edition. I guess that game, uh, is it turning one or turning two at this point? I think it's two, right? Did it come out in 2021? Am um. I- I can't no, remember. I think it was last year. Let's see. It's an anniversary of some sort. It came out June 16th, 2022. Okay. okay. So it's a, it's just over a year old. We have the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge Anniversary Edition. It's available for pre-order on limited run games. Pre-orders end on October 15th. So there is a $35 version of the game, which 
is just like the base game, but it also comes with the, the new Dimension Shellshock DLC. There's also a $65 edition, which is uh, the Anniversary Edition Classic Edition. Put edition twice in that title. Uh, it comes with a case that looks like a VHS box, which is very cool. Oh, uh, stickers, cool. a strategy guide, and a coupon for a free personal pan pizza at Pizza Hut. No which way. is a, a beautiful homage to how I think that the original Ninja Turtles movie came with a personal pan pizza coupon. So that's incredible. I wonder I if it's like that. a real, an actual coupon. Like, I would have to think so. Like, yeah, I guess you it, can't advertise that and it not be real. It doesn't say anywhere, like uh, at least that I saw, like a disclaimer that it's not like a usable coupon. But if I got that, there's no way I'm I'm dropping that off to be on yeah, my Pizza yeah. Hut. I'm putting that in like my uh my my little like ninja turtle shrine that you can see over my shoulder <laughs> right here um but yeah that that is available october 15th it's not quite as cool as the original like physical collector's edition that came out when the game originally came out that had some really cool stuff included in it but it's it's a nice consolation prize if you missed out on that i think that original one was like 200 dollars, and also it's been completely sold out since before it, i think that game even came out i think it was like a pre-order only situation so that is that one. We also have Sonic Origins Plus got a mm. new uh, special edition that's a physical version. Um, God, I, I didn't make note of where it's available, but it is a European site. I think Pixel Pals or something like that is what it's called. Um, I, I messed that up. But anyway, uh, it's 80 euros, which is approximately $84. It comes with the physical game with a 20-page art book and reversible cover, which is just the standard sonic origins plus physical version comes with a certificate numbered out of 1200 units so i guess it's a pretty limited physical version a new 96 page art book which sounds amazing since this is like you know art surrounding the original games of the sonic yeah. franchise this isn't like some new thing that they created new art for i would imagine this is probably like old stuff which is always fascinating to see like art from games of like your childhood uh, an acrylic plate with the game's key art, which the game's key art is just chef's kiss unbelievable. So I, I, I'm not a, I'm not mad at that at all. Four lithographs featuring the four playable characters. So Sonic, Knuckles, Tails, Amy. A large format cardboard box with a screen printed plastic sleeve. And then if you pre-order it, the pre-order bonus is a Mega Drive style game box. Oh, which that's awesome. looks very cool. It, it's a very cool homage to the games that you know, are included in this collection. But it's coming out at the end of this year. But the thing I want to ask you is, how do you feel about post-launch collector's editions like this? Like, you know, because you can you can go in like a, a developer will be like, oh, you can buy the game digitally. You can buy it physically. Or you can also buy the collector's edition. These come out months, sometimes even years after the game came out. How does that leave you feeling? I, I mean, I don't mind it. I think it's cool. And in a way, it's nice because sometimes I don't know if I'm going to like the game. So it's cool to have the chance to play it at a standard price and then be like, oh, okay, I'm obsessed with this. I love this game. I want to have some really cool pieces of merch from it and then buy that collector's edition rather than spending, I don't know, these companies are like Final Fantasy 16's collector's edition was almost $400. Oof. So spending $400 before you've even played a game and know how you feel about it seems kind of wild. Um, so in that sense, I like it. Personally, though, I don't typically buy... Um, collector's editions like that is like my video game purchases that happen after launch are usually like vinyl or maybe art um so sometimes they include vinyls and i love those but buying like another copy of the game i don't typically do too often the only thing that i dislike about this is the people who are going to buy this already have the game right like yeah. people who want to buy a shredder's revenge collector's edition were the people who pre-ordered this game digitally. And they were like, yeah, there's no way I'm waiting a second longer than I have to to play this game. Yeah. So it kind of sucks that you can't buy these things. Like I, I've always, I've kind of given crap to uh, places that they're like, oh, it's a collector's edition, but the game's not included. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of see the reasoning for not including the game in a package such as this. Like if I could buy that Sonic Origins Plus and not have to pay money for the physical game that I already own on like three platforms because I bought it. I, like I bought it on Xbox. My review copy of Sonic Origins was on PlayStation because that was the code that they were able to provide ahead of launch. And then I wanted it on Switch. So I bought it on Switch as well because I was like, well, this, uh, this is a, a, an amazing package to have on the go. So I don't want to buy another copy of Sonic Origins Plus. But that said, 
I want that art book. <laughs> you might buy another copy. Of and I want that Gordon's acrylic <laughs> plate with the game's key art. And I want those lithographs. And the Mega Drive style game box is amazing. So it's How like, much is it? it's about $84. Cause it's, it's the price is listed in euros. So yeah, it's about mm. $84, but I bet that like if they removed the game from that, it's probably a, a decent $20 cheaper. You would yeah. think. So I don't know. Like, I, I, I guess I'm not like too salty about it, but that's the only hesitation. Like, I agree with you. Like, if I've played this game, like Shredder's Revenge, we had an idea that game was going to be good, but we didn't realize how good it was going to be. We didn't realize it was going to be the best Turtles game in almost 30 years. Yeah. So the fact that it is that way and we know that it's a known quantity at this point, I feel more comfortable buying a collector's edition of that magnitude. However, it's also like, ah, I already own this on, I think I do own that on three consoles as well. Yeah, because I had it, I bought it on Xbox, I bought it on Switch, and then when the PS5 version came out, I got that as well because I have a friend who likes to play Shredder's Revenge, and we played a couple times on PS5. So yeah, it's it's hard to justify going on uh, another purchase of that game, but that uh, that VHS box is sweet. So I yeah, don't know, that's that, just kind of mixed mixed uh, reactions from me on that one. But yeah. I, largely, I think I'm with you on that on that end. Uh, it's a big week for Sonic uh, overall. You know, we had that collection edition. Sonic Superstars revealed its battle mode. So you play as a customized metal fighter. So we saw like a metal Knuckles, metal Sonic, other metal prototypes of different characters that I think you can just flat out create. Uh, there's a few different modes. There's race, which is self-explanatory. There's zap scrap, where you shoot projectiles at other players. There's Star Snatcher, where you collect stars within the time limit. There's Survival, where you avoid obstacles and stay on the stage for as long as possible. And then you can play it online or locally. And if you play it locally, you can do it against friends or against the CPU, which is a, a good uh, good little feature as well. And uh, we also got an animated short featuring the three bad guys, Dr. Eggman, Fang the Hunter, and Trip. So you can watch that on YouTube. Those animated shorts that they put out for Sonic games is they're always amazing. They're, they they do such a great job with the animation. They do amazing storytelling without any voice acting in most cases. Yeah. So go check that out. Um, and that game comes out on October seventeenth. So I cannot wait for Sonic Superstars. I wrote our cover story as I've talked about on this show. Uh, every moment that I've played of that game tells me it's just a great continuation of those original Sonic games that we just talked about in Sonic Origins. So that is that corner of the Sonic universe. And then we also, today that we're recording this, so yesterday for uh, people who are listening to this on the release of this episode, marks the launch of Sonic Frontier's final free content update. So this Yay. is the one that adds story content, it adds new challenges, and it adds playable Amy, Knuckles, and Tails. So I was watching the trailer. I haven't had a chance to dig in because we we're recording this prior to the actual launch of it. So I have not had a chance to play it, but the Sonic team did release a trailer for it this morning and it looks more involved than what I was thinking was going to happen. So yeah. I thought we were going to get like playable arenas featuring these characters. I didn't think they were going to give us like free exploration because like, it's like, all right, how do you translate like Amy to running around in this but like they made it so they actually jump on like vehicles so like amy oh, has cool. like a little like like a, a wheel thing that she jumps in and it makes it lets her go fast it looks like the little thing that uh general grievous was riding in when he was running away from obi-wan mm -hmm. when he was riding that yeah. lizard um so it's like a little wheel vehicle like that and then uh tails gets what looks like the tornado to like kind of zoom around on the surface and i'm assuming he can fly and then uh knuckles has like his his ability to punch and everything so that's that looks like it's pretty cool they all have like distinct abilities which i'm really excited for i, I can't wait to dig into that but uh yeah it looks like there's a decent amount of story content and they're hinting that there's something bigger going on with sonic as well so it would be interesting to see what exactly they do with hmm. that does that so, game tease a sequel like the base game um i mean it, not really i don't think like there's hmm. mysteries that are left unresolved so i'm wondering if they're gonna kind of tackle those in this like there's some stuff that i'm like oh i would have loved some more like exploration of this thing that happened in the story like it's weird they didn't go more in depth about that so i would i would be surprised they didn't go more into like the mysteries of these per this particular race of characters that they bring up in in the base game 
but yeah, I'm mo- I'm most excited to see how Amy Knuckles and Tails play, and then also like of yeah. course the more story content because I I enjoyed the story of Sonic Frontiers quite a bit. Um, but yeah, that is out now for free, no matter what version of the game you own. Uh, so we're going to close out the news portion of this show with a Lego news story. So Lego has announced the next release in the Super Mario Brothers set. How yeah. big of a Lego guy are you, Wes? Um, I'm not too big on Legos, mostly because my wife is big on Legos. So when we buy Legos, she builds them. And um, and I, so I, I buy a lot of Legos, basically. My nephew loves them. My wife loves them. I spend a lot of Lego money. I don't touch a lot of Legos. Do you have any of the Mario Legos? I do not, but I have bought my nephew a good bit of them. All the ones that aren't like stupid expensive, like the giant Bowser cast. Um, but like for his birthdays and Christmas and all that, I always get him like a, some piece of the Mario Lego set. Mm. So this is the next one. It is a nine inch tall piranha plant. Yeah. And that's really uh, cool. it's 540 pieces and it actually has a posable mouth and a posable stem. So that's pretty cool. And then it's uh, $60 out November 6th. The the highlight of one or not the highlight, because the highlight of Nintendo Live was definitely the orchestra performance per- playing all mm. the Zelda music and then the big band performance of the Mario music. But one of the highlights for me in terms of like stuff on the show floor was I think it was a 16 foot tall Lego Bowser. Oh, and that's awesome. It actually moved like it was a photo op that you could or a video op, I guess, technically. And you would get your group in front of the Lego Bowser and they would say, all right, three, two, one. And the Bowser would start moving and like turning like what? like he's chasing after you. And you had to act like you were running. It would play the, the castle theme from the original Super Mario Brothers as you were like pretending to run away from this giant Lego Bowser. Dang. That's so cool. It was very neat. Um, So uh, that immediately made me want to get some, that, especially that giant Bowser. But that's like, what, $400 or $300 or something like that? Something like that, yeah. It's It's obscenely expensive and also probably more time than I have to commit to building that thing. (laughs) But that's all the news for today. I did want to close out this first segment. It's only going to be a two-segment episode. But I wanted to close out this first segment just talking a little bit about my experience with the Pokemon Scarlet and Violet expansion called the Teal Mask. This is the first of two expansions that are planned for this game. I have not played through the entire thing, so I'm not going to give like a full review or anything like that. But basically, it takes you into an entirely different area. Like I forget which region it is. It's actually a different region established in the Pokemon universe. Is it the Hoenn region, maybe? But anyway... The, is it Unova? It might be Unova. Uh, I yeah. just remember I was like, oh, they're leaving Paldea. That's kind of cool. Like, they, that doesn't happen very often in mainline Pokemon games. I mean, the most memorable one being when you leave Johto to go back to Kanto in Pokemon uh, Silver and Gold. And But that's kind of cool that you're going to a different region in the in the Pokemon world. And you kind of experience the, the lore and the mythology of this ogre that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a Pokemon, but it's, it's an ogre style Pokemon and like the the mystery is like all right this ogre was harassing this village and these three brave Pokemon banded together and like scared it off into the mountains and they're like kind of like these protectors of the village but you kind of unravel like this this actual like the real story of what happened and it's like this closely guarded secret with this family and it's actually a very touching story what I've played so far and like I like the characters even if their character design is kind of stupid but like the characters themselves, I actually felt a good connection to and I really enjoyed uh, getting to know them. And like, I actually felt bad because there's this one time where you have to like lie to one of the characters and like they know you're lying to them. But like you don't know oh. that like your character doesn't know they're lying to them. And it's just like, oh, why did why do you have to do that? It like it, you kind of watch this this one character's heart break in real time. And you're just like, oh, man, this is kind of this is kind of rough to experience. But like it's. It's a good story so far, but the thing that I don't like is that, like, going back to this game a year later, right? Like, Scarlet and Violet came out last year, and the big knock against it was the performance. And I thought, like, okay, I I gave it a year. Nintendo put out that tweet shortly after Scarlet and Violet launched where it was like, you know, we understand, like, this is unacceptable. We're going to put everything we can into fixing it. You go back. I, I, so I, I went from playing Mortal Kombat 1 on PS5, which, as I mentioned earlier, buttery smooth, just 
as consistent of a frame rate as you can get, high res textures. It felt like I was taking psychic damage when I moved to Scarlet and Violet <laughs> and how this game performs, how this game looks like I was just like, Oh, this is, this is hard to go back to even now, a year later, like they had a year to make this game run better. And I understand there's probably more wrong with Scarlet and Violet than can be fixed in post-release patches. Yeah. But at the same time, like it, it is rough to go back to this, especially coming from a game that runs as well as Mortal Kombat one on PS five. So that was my big observation. That was my big takeaway was just that this game needed more time in the hopper before the expansions. And I was hopeful that, okay, we're going to go to this new area. It's more, it's more contained. It's a smaller area. Maybe that will improve the performance. They only have to load in a much smaller area, but it is still, it's still rough, rough paddling, right? You know, it, it's, yeah. It's difficult to go back to it after all this time, after playing all these amazing new gen games on the PS5 and Xbox Series X. To go back to a game that runs like this on Switch is just hard. And it sucks because I love Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Same. That was a game that I wanted to score higher than I did, but I just couldn't with how it ran. And I still gave it a good score. Like I still gave it, I think, an 8.25. And I stand by that. I think that like, it's greater than the sum of its parts in that the experience of that game is still very good in spite of the performance issues. But like yeah. that, that's one of the better Pokemon games outside of that, that one very specific thing that unfortunately permeates through the entire experience. And it just kind of sucks that you go back to the game and experience these, these problems and still have them affecting the game and affecting these new experiences that I would I would otherwise jump into with both feet like it had me thinking because I've talked about this where I was like okay well they used to do this thing where they would release like uh, Pokemon Platinum or Pokemon Ultra Sun Ultra Moon where it was like this newer version of the games that came out before and it came with all these improvements and everything and like if there were any technical problems they would fix those in these these updated versions and I was like okay with Sword and Shield, they just did away with that. We didn't get, like, Sword, Shield, Gun. Like, there was no, like, third entry that was, like, this is the ultimate version of this. We just got DLC and title updates. And I was like, okay, this is the better way to do it. It's like how when, like, yeah. Street Fighter Four did away with, or Street Fighter Five did away with, like, the multiple versions of the game in favor of just doing DLC and title updates and seasons. Like, it's like, okay, this is finally these companies embracing the era that we are in with the internet and everything. However... Going back to Scarlet and Violet through the teal mask makes me believe that Game Freak would have been better off just releasing an all new version of this game. Like it, one of the selling points on the back of the freaking box could have been runs at a stable 30 frames per second. And then that yes. would have, I bet that Pokemon Scarlet and Violet Ultra or whatever it ended up being called would have been one of the top selling games on the Switch just for, hey, this is a game that, but again, they, they couldn't do that from a PR perspective. Because yeah. if they released a, a game like, and the, one of the selling points is actually works, <laughs> that would, would be, yeah, be in catastrophic. And But like, it almost feels necessary. Like they needed to kind of rebuild this game from scratch and go back to the drawing board to make it run the way it should have. And I wish, I almost wish they would have done that instead of like releasing Teal Mask and uh, God, what's the, the second one called? Indigo. Indigo something? Disc. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, instead of releasing these, I wish they would have just like figured out some way to include them, but also like release like an ultimate edition of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet with all the various improvements that could probably only be made by rebuilding this game in some way. Uh, but then like, they'd have to like figure out some way to like have like an upgrade path for people who already bought the, the non-working version of this game. So yeah, that it's complicated feelings because I'm still having a really great time with it. And, uh, you know, I still think it's one of the better Pokemon games underneath the the multiple problems. But, yeah, it's it's hard to recommend Pokemon Scarlet and Violet from that perspective, looking back a year later and it's still not fixed. So, I don't know. Are you checking out this? Because I know you like the game much like I do. You like yeah, the yeah. base game of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, even in spite of all those problems. 
Yeah, it's probably my favorite Pokemon generation since Gen 5, maybe, yeah. to be honest. Um, but yeah, like you, I, I loved it in spite of just some of the worst issues uh, in a Pokemon game. Um, and I have uh, I have this uh, DLC, but I have not checked it out, mostly because I was planning to. And then, yeah, I've, I've heard similar sentiment like you, where it's not quite fixed, and it doesn't sound like an urgent must-play DLC. Um, and given, you know, the games releasing around us right now, uh, it's not something I am trying to prioritize. But I, I am planning to go back to it. Like, I'm legitimately excited to go back to that um, that world. And um, it just sucks that it runs as pro. I've even seen some play. Some people say it like runs sometimes even worse than like the base game. Like it's shocking how bad its performance is a year later. Um, so that's kind of killed my buzz for it. But I am going to play it. I, I am excited too. Yeah, I, and I think I, I I just wish Game Freak would staff up a little bit because I think I looked it up. I don't know if it was you on the episode, but I looked it up and it was like, all right, what is the comparison of staff size for? Game Freak, and then I was like, let me just find like another random AAA developer. And it was like Game Freak had like 169 employees, and like Bungie had something like 2,000 employees. <laughs> and it was like, I know they're making completely different games. One's a live service game, one has, you know, Xbox Series X and PS5 graphics and everything, but it's just like, come Still, on. It's wild. Pokemon yeah. is the, the highest grossing entertainment franchise on the planet, not just video games, any entertainment franchise. So, like, I, I just wish they would treat it as such in the game development side. Same. Uh, not that, you know, I think they're very talented developers. I just think that in they're, they're understaffed for what they're trying to do. And it, it shows in the release of Scarlet and Violet and then the continued release through Teal Mask and Indigo Disc. I remember well, thinking with when Sword and Shield came out, the performance on those games was not the best either, but much better than Scarlet and Violet. And I remember like the sentiment was like, well, this was like, you know, their first crack at the switch. It's, uh, they probably started mid development, like mid switch, uh, development. Like it's not, you know, this isn't the full thing. Give them time. So that yeah. happened. And then we got Scarlet and Violet. And it's like, all right, this is the moment. And then, yeah. Well, it's now like, the excuse man. is like, oh, well it's their first open world game. So maybe that that's what it is. So like, yeah. The only thing I can think of is like the next Pokemon game is almost certainly coming out on the next Nintendo console. Mm -hmm. If they screw that up, then it's like, okay, this series might be in trouble because yeah. it's this is their third attempt at making like a true console game. I mean, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee was essentially just a remake of the Pokemon Yellow for for Switch. And that, that ran perfectly okay from what I remember. Like maybe there yeah. were some hiccups here and there. Sword and Shield, like you said, had some rough patches, but it was overall fine. But it was also the linear style of Pokemon games. Scarlet and Violet was their first real attempt at open world. So, like, you know, maybe they'll have some sort of improved performance on the next one. Maybe they've learned some things about how to optimize an open world. Maybe just the improved perf uh, power of whatever Nintendo's next console is will aid them. But all we know is something has to change in order to make it so that these games run the way they should. Yeah, go talk to the Tears of the Kingdom team. Game Freak, I mean, please. I would like, not be surprised if Nintendo was like, hey, Monolith, go help them out. Like, like yeah. you helped us out with Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild. Like, that would actually be a very smart move if they sent Monolith over to assist with the Dolan. Did that even happen? Like, is that something that <laughs> did I, I think dream? they might they might have, but I don't know. Look, it's look wild too because Scarlet and Violet, it's not just that they're open world. Like their art style isn't. I like I like monster designs and some of the characters and stuff. But like when you look at Tears of the Kingdom, for example, or even Xenoblade, like the visual design of those worlds compared to Scarlet and Violet is basically otherworldly. So yeah, I don't know. I don't. I just I want the next Pokemon game to look like a a normal open world game, and I want it to run like a normal open world game. By the way, we like also not asking too much. We completely forgot about Pokemon Legends Arceus. Yeah, that that too, which does run better than Scarlet and Violet, right? But it does also have its own issues, from what I've heard. There, so there is some rumblings that maybe Monolith helped out with Legends Arceus. Okay, well then it shows if that's true. And also, we're not the first people to say like Monolith should help out. Like Game Rant is like it's time to let Monolith Soft make a Pokemon game. There's a game FAQs board. Why didn't they call in Monolith Soft for help? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then another game FAQs. Just imagine a Pokemon game made by Monolith Soft. <laughs> so this is not wild. a new sentiment, apparently. 
Yeah. But uh, Wes, we're going to take our only break of this episode. And when we get back, we're going to try something a bit new, a draft, something all podcasters love. We will yeah. be right back. We are back, and we're going to try something a little bit different this episode. Podcasts have been doing this since the dawn of time, so we're going to try it ourselves. This is the inaugural All Things Nintendo Draft. This is going to kind of take the place of definitive ranking during some weeks, while others we might just default back to that old reliable. But this week, I want to draft the remaining games of 2023. So, you know, we've talked about how busy the rest of this year is going to be. So... We're going to do a serpentine draft until we reach four games each, and then we'll see who the listeners think has a better lineup of games. So, Wes, I'm going to do a random choice. So, call it one or two. I'm doing an RNG uh, website. One or two. Two. It is one. So, (sighs) I am going to choose to pick first. I wonder what it will be. And... uh, We are going to, so I'll get the first pick, then you'll get the second pick and the third pick. So that's how it's going to work. And then I'll get fourth, fifth, and you'll get sixth, seventh, and then I'll get the last one. So there is some advantages because just because I get a solid first pick, you get the next two off the board. Yeah. So uh, there's there's some advantages and disadvantages there. But so we're going to be picking until we each have four games. I'm going to go with Super Mario Brothers Wonder. Oh, wow. Shocking. Yeah, what a surprise. I think that game looks fantastic. Uh, You know, we're about three weeks away from launch, which is really wild to say. That's, uh, yeah, comes out October 20th. That game, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It is the most creative a 2D Mario game has been since Yoshi's Island on SNES. And, you know, I I think it looks looks like the bee's knees, Wes. Oh, I can't wait. And I'm sure it will do great for your draft. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So it's your turn now. I'm, I'm making notes here. So you'll hear me typing up these uh, these picks. Yeah. But what is your number one pick off the board? My number one pick off the board is Super Mario RPG. Oh, that's a good one. A bona fide too. classic. We know the base game is good. So assuming they don't drastically change this and people like the art style already, I think it's a solid pick. I've that never played it. Pick. So I'm excited to play it first time. Yeah, that is one that I am also looking forward to. I, I only played the introduction, so I have not ever actually played the, the 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 full version of that game. But I know it is, like you said, it's a bona fide classic. People are very excited for it. What is your number two pick? My number two should sound familiar: Sonic Superstars. Ah! <laughs> oh, I'm so mad you got that one. You you knew I was my number two pick yeah. too. So you, like, you got jump man. So I had to take his uh, RPG version and uh, his arch rival <laughs> Sonic away from you. See, this is why. You may not have done too poorly for yourself getting the number two and number three picks True. because yeah. those are two very good picks. But uh, how are you feeling about Sonic Superstars? I'm excited. Um, I have. I'm like a. I've recently gone through the original Sonic games, like over the past two years, ever since the uh, collection um, Origins, um, or maybe past year. I don't know. But I'm currently in Sonic Three, and so I've I've Ooh. come into a newfound appreciation for classic Sonic, and I'm excited to see that this is uh, like a continuation of that. Um, Sonic Three, my favorite Sonic game, by the way. Yeah, I'm still like very early, like first. Uh, couple stages but i'm excited and it it just took a minute for me to like understand sonic's lingo because as someone who didn't grow up with uh like that kind of gameplay it had to click and now that it's clicked though i'm like okay i see what i see what sonic's doing here yeah i mean i think that is a very good pick you definitely need to check out sonic mania once you get through yes uh, sonic 3 and knuckles because sonic mania is a perfect continuation of that classic style and then superstars is the continuation of mania essentially Mm. um so if you read the cover story that actually was how sonic superstars came to be is they were takashi azuka and the creator of sonic mania christian whitehead were kind of discussing like oh what should be next for like this style of sonic game and then unfortunately it never came to be because Christian Whitehead left to go found his own studio. And then, um, you know, the Sonic team was like, all right, well, let's take some of these ideas that they discussed and uh, bring in Naoto Oshima, who was 
uh, the, the creator of the Sonic character back in the uh, the early '90s. So yeah, I mean that that Sonic Superstars incredibly solid pick. All right, so I think we have a tiny bit of a drop off following yeah. those three heavy hitters. But I have two games that I am excited to add to my lineup here. I'm going to go WarioWare Move It. Yeah, that's a good pick. And that is, uh, you know, I've talked about it. It's the continuation, seemingly, of the one on Wii, WarioWare Smooth Moves, which I think is the best WarioWare game. <laughs> so much fun. I'm excited for all the zany movements it's going to make us do with our Joy-Cons. And uh, it's the perfect party game, if it's anything yeah. like the Wii version. So WarioWare Move It, coming out November 3rd. I'm uh, just kind of looking over here. Oh, I just thought of one that I'm going to do instead of the one I was going to do. Persona 5 Tactica. Ah, uh, yeah. I okay. completely missed that. From each other. <laughs> I was going to go with a different one. Maybe it'll still be around when it comes back around, but uh, I doubt it. The, the last pick will be around. But yeah, Persona 5 Tactica, it is coming out November 17th. I am a huge Persona 5 fan. I, uh, I'm not as excited for the tactics uh format but i'm not like opposed to it i've loved what i've played of it i'm just uh kind of hesitant to not have it be like kind of a turn-based rpg as much as it is a turn-based tactics but that that aside i am so excited for another adventure with these characters i wish the art style was more in line with the other persona 5 games but i will live with the chibi art style yeah. but that is my number three pick what are your three and fours my next one is one that I'm one of my most anticipated secretly Ooh. star ocean. The second story R. Um, that is the remake of, uh, I don't know what the original game is called, but the, de- the demo's out. I think the demo's great. And I think it's one of the best uses of that 2d HD, um, thing that square Enix has been doing for a minute. And yeah, I'm just like, I just can't wait. It's like a, cl- a classic meaty RPG, um, and it looks beautiful and it's sci-fi which is very cool yeah it uh that looks like a very good game i have no history whatsoever with the star ocean series so i'll just take your word for it congratulations i I don't have a history either but i'm excited i mean it looks cool um let me see yeah this is my number four right this is my last your last pick huh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky because like there are so many games coming out but a, a limited number of them coming to switch i have one i have two ooh, one ooh. i'm just gonna go with this one because i'm just not sure about the other one metal gear solid collection volume one oh. uh f- first three uh, metal gear solid games i think um first time they'll be playable on switch those games rule um little concerned about the performance uh based on some information they released about the games but if they perform well then yeah having the first three metal metal gear solid games on switch is going to be a huge win um yes i'm excited to see if you're going to pick the other one that i almost did I'm going with Detective Pikachu Returns. Yeah, you did. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Fair it's, enough. it's not a. I mean, we. It's not a, a mainline Pokemon game, but I, I liked what I played. I, I thought yeah. it was fun. I didn't play the first one, but I'd like to check this out at some point. And uh, it's going to be tricky this this upcoming month, but you know that's coming out next week, which is so wild. Really? To think about. Yeah, that is October sixth. Uh, I'm not seeing. <laughs> they need to like i've not seen nothing about that game i mean you guys had your previews recently but i haven't i did not know it was coming out next week and that is a tough time to come out uh when you're not a spider-man or an alan wake 2 or a, a, a mario's wonder Jeez. so what was your first alternate because originally this is going to be a five uh five game pick them pick a uh, five, yeah. five game draft but then i was like wait that doesn't make sense with the two-person serpentine method yeah, because yeah. then i would just get another pick now so i'm glad we did four because i think there's like an even bigger drop off after four for me um if i had let me see what i have left i had one uh, dave the diver is kind of a cheat because we already know it's great and it's oh, come everywhere and it's one. coming yeah it comes to switch this october i think no that that's um, a, that would be actually really good on your list like i would i would have been mad yeah, that I yeah. didn't think of that and then 
I was also uh, actually that's really it. I'm not I'm not confident in the other picks necessarily. It's I mean at that point we're, I'm kind of just looking at ports. Um, but yeah, what, what was your alternate? So I had two. I was gonna uh, I was looking at wild card football, which is gonna be the only oh yeah like I don't want to say triple A maybe double A football game on the switch like there's a few like retro style football games this is going to be like this is kind of like nfl blitz meets mario kart is the best way to describe yeah. that so that's one that i'm i'm oddly excited for it comes out october 10th and then also one that uh i know you've gotten your hands on i've gotten my hands on it as well hot wheels unleashed 2 turbo oh, yeah. charge that one comes out october, i didn't know that was coming to switch october 19th yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure it is. I'm almost certain it's coming I think to so, Switch. Yeah. But I just had blocked that. That is into. that. I mean, that is the uh, the draft. So I got Super Mario Brothers Wonder, WarioWare Move It, Persona 5 Tactica, and Detective Pikachu Returns. Wes, you have Super Mario RPG, Sonic Superstars, still stings, Star Ocean, the second story R, and Metal Gear Solid Master Collection Volume 1. I think those are, I mean, the fact that we could pull eight games and have yeah. that good of lists and still have alternates tells me that this is a very good uh, stretch for game releases. Yeah, when you sent me the uh, prompt, I was like, oh God, I don't I don't know, Mario and Sonic, what else? And then I looked at our <laughs> 2023 calendar and I was like, oh my gosh, no, it's not, uh, we don't slow down after October. We just kind of barrel right into November and December. Yeah, and it is a, uh, it's a continuing to just, add new stuff like you said dave the diver was one we didn't know was coming uh uh, counter-strike 2 just surprise launch it's not on switch it's a steam exclusive so far but like count a sequel to counter-strike one of the biggest games of all time just surprise it's out now on a wednesday afternoon in the middle of one of the busiest release stretches we've had in recent memory so I, I was just I made the joke of like oh yeah our, our review section was really struggling to find spots to to <laughs> fill this month um, but all right, Wes, that brings us to the mainstay closer here, the eShop gem of the week, a chance to give a shout out to a game that might not otherwise get a shout out uh, on this this podcast. This is one that uh, friends of the show, Kit Ellis and Krista Yang, formerly of Nintendo, now the Kit and Krista podcast, they actually did some consulting work or some some PR work with this game. And they passed it along to me. They're like, "Hey, check this game out. It's a, uh, it's a like a, a. We think you'll dig it. It's a, it's a Game Boy style platformer that's available mm. on Switch. It is called Curse Cracker, Curse Crackers for whom the bell toils. And bell spelled B E L L E. So like that's like her name. Mm. And it really looks like it's a Game Boy Color release. Like it, I'm looking at the screenshots right now, and I played a little bit of this on an airplane on, on one of my many recent trips. And yeah, I I played through several levels of it and I was kind of hooked for a little bit, you know, like it, it is just a 2d platformer, uh, starring, uh, bell and you're chasing down Bonnie and, um, she's, she's, uh, basically just on a 2d platforming adventure. She has different objects she can swing off of. And it's like, you're finding like different routes through these levels, but it's, it's very much a traditional, like game boy advance style platformer Hmm. and you know if you look at the the graphics of it you're like wow this was not like a an nes or a game boy or a game boy color game that just came out that we didn't know about and it's like being ported like you can tell the developers have a great affection for that era of game and yeah i'm looking at it now and it's yeah that's definitely just straight up gba yeah and then there's like an arcade mode after you beat the game that like lets you play it with like nine different levels of difficulty so like they they went in depth about it and it's you know I, I did not get all the way through but like the the game uh description does say it's built for replayability with like different pathways secrets to find collectibles all stuff like that so you know I I had a great time with it it had a uh kind of a a really tight platforming style but also like you know charming art style for the the Game Boy Color influence. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it came out August 24th on Switch and it's 15 bucks. So if that if if you have a great affection for the Game Boy Color era of games, this would probably be right up your alley. Nice. Looks awesome. All right, Wes. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Do me a favor. If you haven't already, throw all things in all, throw thing, throw all things Nintendo a five-star review. Hit that subscribe button. And if you want to get any questions, comments, or feedback in, you can get in touch with me at allthingsnintendo at GameInformer.com or hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky, Threads, wherever, at Brian P. Shea. I'm also going to be over on the Game Informer Community Discord, which is a perk for subscribing to our Twitch channel even just for one month. Wes, tell everyone where they can find you on the internet. You can follow me on Twitter at LeBlancWes, and I'm basically everywhere else, like uh, Blue Sky and Threads and all that, uh, at Wesley LeBlanc. Um, and then you can read my work at GameInformer.com and sometimes hear my voice on YouTube.com slash GameInformer and other podcasts like this. That is our show for this week. Thank you all again so much for listening. Take care. We will see you next time. <laughs>